It was May 16, 1967 in Bournemouth, England, and a young man named Robert Fripp was celebrating his 21st birthday with his family. More importantly, he had made a significant decision that day to announce a change of heart. Although he was on path to pursue a career in estate management, his heart was in playing the guitar. While no reaction has been documented, it's possible that Arthur, Robert's father, was devastated upon hearing the news, especially since Robert was supposed to follow in his footsteps. Yet, Robert stood his ground. One day, while reading Melody Maker, Robert stumbled upon an ad for a progressive, intelligent musician. Subsequently, Robert answered the calling, and on the other end were the Giles brothers, Michael, who was a drummer, and Peter, a bassist. The duo had been in various groups by that point, and although they had recorded various songs, they had yet to achieve creative fulfillment. After auditioning and proving his worth, the three agreed to move out to London and share a flat, where they would live together while rehearsing and occasionally recording material. Meanwhile, a young man named Ian MacDonald had just returned to London after serving in the British Army as a musician for the past five years. His homecoming was thanks to his father bailing him out. One day, Ian met Peter Sinfield, a mediocre musician, yet also an exceptionally gifted lyricist. Ian recognized this talent in Sinfield and subsequently asked him if he would be interested in collaborating to compose material. The two agreed, cementing an important relationship. Ian would also begin dating Judy Dibel, who at the time had just been in the group Fairport Convention. By 1968, the highly eccentric musical trio, by this point known as Giles, Giles and Fripp, managed to secure a recording deal with Decca. In spite of their unusual image, they still managed to convince the record label of their worth due to their style and musicianship. By September 1968, their cheerful Insanity album was released, but it turned out to be a commercial flop. The new group, still hanging on to their deal with Decca, while also seeking more collaborators, decided to place an ad in the paper. The unofficial trio, comprising Ian, Peter Sinfield, and Ian's then-girlfriend Judy, replied to the ad. The new conglomerate went on to write and unofficially record new material together, but before long, Judy decided to part with the newfound company. However, Ian's multi-talented nature remained an asset to Giles, Giles and Fripp, as did Peter Sinfield's lyrics, so the two stayed on. One night in late 1968, Robert and Michael held a conversation in the small hours in their flat to discuss the direction of a potential new band. The proposed style for this new group would be akin to John McLaughlin combined with Jethro Tull, although the end result proved to be more unique than either of these two artists. Michael proposed utilizing a double bass drum kit, and it was remembered that Ian had already taken a keen interest in the Mellotron, but perhaps the most important addition would be that of a strong lead vocalist and bassist. Although Peter Giles had already been serving in that capacity, Robert, prompted by this new musical direction, suggested a possible replacement, his old friend Greg Lake. After ringing up Greg, Robert mentioned that while a record deal with Decca was in place, the new group did not need two guitarists, so he asked Greg if he could serve as bassist. Upon agreeing to join the band, Greg was scheduled to move to London by December 1968 and into a new living space. Ian's uncle, Angus Hunking, financed the new band's expansion through a loan, with which it became possible to acquire new instruments, including a PA system. The band had also found interest in management in the form of David Enthoven and John Gaydon, who would later be known collectively as EG. And with the band's rehearsal space manifesting in the basement of Fulham Palace Cafe, discovered by Peter Sinfield, January 13th, 1969 was later agreed upon as their first official rehearsal date. While January 13th is fondly remembered as the birthday of King Crimson, as they later came to be known, thanks to Peter Sinfield, it wasn't peaches and cream from the start. 
One of the most significant problems the band faced was Greg not meeting their standard musically. Greg did not have the same jazz inclination that the other three musicians did, but what he lacked in musical ability, he made up for with his powerful voice and style. There was even a time when the band thought they might need to replace Greg for a more skilled player, but with time he caught up with the others. Following this dilemma, the band secured their first residency at the Changes Club in Newcastle in February of 1969. The experience gave the band an idea of how to reform their performances and make them more distinct. Although they had good intentions, more work still needed to be done. Back in the cafe basement, the band's efforts attracted a small audience with people spreading the word about a mysterious group playing incredible music. Subsequently, the band began promoting their work visually. Barry Godber, a friend of Peter's who was a computer programmer turned artist, designed a flaming eye poster that was used to announce the band's name while suggesting intrigue. As rehearsals continued, the band attracted Moody Blues producer Tony Clark, who saw potential in Crimson and encouraged them to consider him for producing their first album. By April 9, 1969, a gig at the Speakeasy Club in London proved to be a smashing success. It had been a little less than three months since their first rehearsal, and the band had finally found their voice. More significantly, members from Yes and various big names in the music industry were in attendance. Their first number was 21st Century Schizoid Man, and the impact of the band's new sound proved to be so powerful that nearly everyone in the club stopped and stared in amazement. Peter's light show proved especially complimentary, with various colors and effects used to accentuate the nuances of the music. Even Peter Banks of Yes was so moved that despite having ordered a drink that night, never touched it. May 16, 1969 saw the start of a lengthy residency at the Marquee Club in London, where the band became a hit. Meanwhile, recording sessions with Tony Clark were underway at Morgan Studios, but proved to be challenging for the band, as Clark was more keen on moving away from the improvisation element of Crimson's music, among other things. During a gig at the Revolution Club, the band was witnessed by none other than Jimi Hendrix, who was observed to be jumping up and down while proclaiming that Crimson was the best band in the world. After the gig, he approached Robert and told him, Shake my left hand, man. It's closer to my heart. One day changed Ian's love life forever. When boarding from London's public transit system at Richmond Station, he encountered Charlotte Bates, who was with her kitten and a friend. Although feeling a strong attraction, Ian did not pluck up the courage to approach her on the spot. Yet the subsequent memories of her haunted him. Eventually, he decided to place an ad in the underground International Times paper. While a seeming long shot, Charlotte later heard of the ad through her friend, and after ringing up Ian, the two hit it off. The band's breakthrough performance took place on July 5th, 1969, with an appearance at a concert in High Park, organized around the Rolling Stones. With hundreds of thousands in attendance, this event was essentially England's Woodstock, preceding the American counterpart by only a month. Following the conclusion of a condensed set, the band received a standing ovation, and their gig scheduled for the following night at the Marquee Club was jam-packed with new fans. Before long, it became evident that their success was spreading like wildfire. Back in the studio, the band were growing increasingly critical of Tony Clark's input to mold the band's image and style to his liking. After some discussion, the band reached the consensus that it would be better to make their own mistakes than someone else's. Ending the relationship with Clark, they decided to produce their first album and move from Morgan to Wessex Studios. They also signed with Island Records, which employed a novel tape lease deal, which meant the band would pay to record the album then license it to Island while retaining the underlying rights. One day, after recording Schizoid Man, and in just one take, Barry Godber, 
previously known for designing the Flaming Eye image, walked in with what would serve as the images for their first album. The first was a painting of an agitated face, and the second of a smiling one. After production for the album concluded, Crimson's debut album, In the Court of the Crimson King, was released in the UK on October 10, 1969. The next step was to take the album to an American record label, and EG set their eyes on the American label Atlantic Records. Following a visit to Ahmed Erdogan, then president of Atlantic, a playback of the new album caught his attention and landed EG a deal on the spot. Signing with Atlantic paved the way for an American tour, which was set to commence on October 27, 1969. However, this transition introduced some of the band's most difficult challenges. The band had established a no-girlfriend policy, which meant Charlotte couldn't tag along. Furthermore, being away from home and familiar surroundings meant the band would not have the same freedom. Michael Giles once described the experience as being like a caged animal, only to be released when the time was right to entertain spectators then retreat back in their cages upon the show's end. In reality, it was not cages, but rather hotels which constituted the form of their confinement. Their first American gig was at Goddard College in Vermont on October 29, 1969. Due to a billing mistake, it had been advertised that soul musician King Curtis and not King Crimson was due to perform on the same day. The crowd reaction to the band's opening proved to be detrimental, as it was suspected that many were dropping acid for the occasion. But with the band's heavy sound, it can only be assumed that several people experienced a very bad trip. During their stay in the US, Greg, Ian, and Peter dabbled with drugs, particularly marijuana. Although Robert and Michael never partook, Ian explored other territory with methamphetamines, also known as speed. While the three band members seemed to enjoy themselves, Robert, the band's spokesman and assumed leader, took advantage of the time away from the stage to continue practicing. Meanwhile, Ian's drug usage remained active during the American tour, perhaps as a coping mechanism for separation anxiety. After persuading EG, who were back in the UK, to allow Charlotte to fly to New York, Ian's wish was granted, and the two were reunited. However, she was only permitted to stay for a brief time before heading back home. Meanwhile, Michael, who was beginning to feel disillusioned with the pressures of touring, shared with Robert the idea of Crimson status shifting to that of a studio band, much like the Beatles. But since Robert was not receptive to the idea, it did not stick. It was during the band's scheduled appearances on the West Coast that the dreaded news came to light. Driving through Big Sur in early December, while headed to the Fillmore West, Robert was in the passenger seat. Ian and Michael were seated behind, and Ian proceeded to tell Robert, plainly, that he and Michael were leaving the band. Robert was heartbroken by the news, so much so that he offered to leave if it meant that they would stay. But Ian insisted that the band should continue with Robert. Meanwhile, Greg felt it would be more appropriate to form an entirely new band with Robert in the wake of the split. However, Robert felt the band's name and what it represented was too important to abandon. Their final gig took place on December 14, 1969 at the Fillmore West. Within the span of a year, Crimson's rise and fall was truly meteoric, to say the least.